welcome to our couch lesson number 15. I'm happy that you join our online series dealing with different aspects of artificial intelligence. And I hope that you have made yourself comfortable, maybe on a couch, maybe with a cold drink in your hand. And I hope that you enjoyed the music you have just heard. It was the song Not Mine from the artist Miquela Sousa, who's also known as Lil Miquela. The 19-year-old singer, activist, and model is one of Instagram's hottest influencer. 1.5 million followers watch her life or the pictures of her life. Miquela spends most of her time singing, writing, and producing her own music, which has topped Spotify charts internationally. But Miquela isn't real. She is a so-called robot model. model. Although she is not really a robot nor an artificial, artificially intelligent being, her success has inspired venture capitalists to invest heavily in virtual creators and work with startups to progress the technology forward. The future of influencers is digital beings that are powered by AI. So which pictures and which persons can we trust when social media channels like Instagram are run by virtual persons based on AI technology. This question leads us to our today's topic. Today we want to speak about AI and reality as always with experts from all over the world. And as always, we want to include your questions and your opinions. The couch lessons are part of the project Generation A is algorithm that aims to sensitize young adults for the challenges and the opportunities of AI. The project is funded by the Federal Foreign Office and organized by the Goethe Institute, the Worldwide Active Cultural Institute of the Federal Republic of Germany. We promote the study of the German language abroad and we also encourage an international cultural exchange. With the Couch Lessons, we want to initiate a discussion outside the technology savvy community. We want to question what AI is and what it could and should decide. We also want to ask if there is a way maybe a European way beyond surveillance and commerce, because a lot of developments in the field of AI are economy driven so far. It's all about power and money, or isn't it? The Goethe Institute deals with AI because this technology will have a huge impact on our society at different levels and in various fields. AI will contribute to a new revolution in human history and it is already a part of our everyday lives. So we have to speak about it. And today we will speak about AI and reality. And before I hand over to Martin, who helped me curating the couch lessons and who's the moderator of the series, I would like to inform you briefly about some guidelines of the couch lessons. First, our experts will give an input, each about 10 minutes long. And after that, we will open the discussion during the whole time, you can ask questions or contribute your opinions in our chat, and I will go through the chat during the talks. I also want you to know that the entire event is recorded, but we will just record the persons that are speaking. That's from my side so far, and I hand over to Martin. The microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Janet. Uh, my name is Martin Tunkvist, uh, and I'm a curator and concept developer based in Malmo in the very south of Sweden. Uh, and with us today, we have Julian Togelius, Hao Li, and Giorgio Patrini, and they're tuning in from New York, Los Angeles, and Amsterdam. Uh, and I'm super excited to hear them share the knowledge and experience on today's topic, topic which is AI and reality. Uh, but before we kick up, kick off, please keep what you, some of you are already doing in the chat, and that is to, to type where you're joining in from. Uh, India, Brussels, Mexico, we have already there. And so it's a good way to create a bit of like an intimate feel to these calls. Uh, the chat is also a great place to float your thoughts and ideas as well as, well as responding to others. And, and also please uh, start asking questions to, to the speakers already, already now or when you hear them talk. And then we will make sure that uh, you will uh, get some of the questions answered at the very end of this hour. So today's topic is reality. 
Uh, and connected to reality is, of course, truth. And truth is a very timely concept and, and a construct we thought we shouldn't have to spend so much time talking about. But in recent years, uh, with election being altered by massive use of misinformation and news outlets that are purposely fake and technolo technological developments, uh, making it hard to separate real imagery from computer generated, uh, computer generated imagery um, has made it much more uh, harder to discriminate what is truth and not. Uh, and, and myself, just like probably most of, of you in this call, is consider yourself like a true believer of the truth. Um, and that there is such a thing as like a right or wrong. But then when you start to sort of think about truth and reality, things gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, and one of my favorite natural uh, phenomena is mirage. And that is the phenomena when you think you see something, but it's actually an optical illusion caused by heat and cold meeting and mixing in, uh, at a very extreme temperature. And so you, you think that you see something in uh, ahead of you, like on the road or, or in a desert, but it's actually not there. So you see it, but it's not there. So it's, uh, you actually see it, but it's, 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 it's not real, right? Um, and this is a lot of the time how reality appears to me. At first glance, a concept seems you know, straightforward and easy to grasp. But the more you dig into it, the more complicated and complex it gets. And you start to realize that tr truths can be a lot of different things from different perspectives in different times and, al and also often uh, after pivotal events in science, et cetera. Um, and also when it comes to all things virtual, reality gets a little bit blurry. And I think one of the sort of the easiest ways to sort of think about that is the expression of IRL or in real life. Uh, and it's a good example, or actually a bad example, of humans trying to separate what happens in, in spaces like we're in now and spaces like, you know, meet space or the other space where we actually can sort of shake and, and hug, shake hands and hug. Um, so we're living in this very interesting time when digital and virtual, virtual are becoming the new real. Uh, and that all of a sudden poses a question. So what is real, really? And does it matter at all? Uh, and what happens to society when it gets increasingly harder to verify that text images and videos are what they claim to be. Uh, so in today's couch session, couch, couch lesson, um, we're inviting you on a journey from the world of games to virtual avatars and deep fakes. Uh, so buckle up and let's get started with the, with the first uh, speaker. His name is Julian Tugelius. He's an associate uh, professor in the, in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the New York University. Uh, and for us, he's going to talk about uh, AI in game development and how to create endless custom-made words uh, created for and only for you and also how real they are. Uh, please beam your energy to Julian Tugelius. The screen and microphone is yours. Julian, you and please, I'm sorry about this. For some reason, um, you gave me the, the screen and the microphone that I had to sneeze. Um, and I, I, I promise you there's no sort of coronavirus transmission of a Zoom, as far as I know. Otherwise, we're all in trouble. Um, anyway, so I'm Julian Tugelius. I'm originally from where Martin is, from Malmö, though I'm in New York City right now. Um, and my story basically is that I wanted to understand the mind, I wanted to understand um, consciousness and really explain it. And I started studying philosophy and psychology. It, I didn't get, well, I, I sort of was stuck because I realized I'm not making any progress this way. Um, I'm studying the thoughts of philosophers and they have some great arguments, but really to understand the mind, I gotta build minds. So, um, it was sort of, uh, for me, um, not back to square one, but basically I need to figure out how do I go about to build minds. Um, that is wrong, I'm not sharing the right screen again. Um, sorry. Share desktop. Hey, that helps. So um, I was thinking that I was going to work on AI for robots. Um, 
But along the way, I discovered games. I mean, I didn't discover games. Um, I discovered games when I was like, I don't know, five or something. But I discovered that games are amazing test beds for um, AI that can then possibly be used in reality and, see, and trying to develop better artificial intelligence. This is a screenshot from one of the games in the Civilization series, where I see the screenshots, just to basically show you how insanely complex it is. And which makes you think that if you had artificial intelligence that could carry out such a complex task as, um, um, uh, as uh, playing one of these games, wouldn't it be quite intelligent? So we did a lot of work on building artificial intelligence for particular problems, and in particular, playing particular video games. We ran competitions on playing Super Mario Bros, which um, um, uh, resulted in some uh, pretty eye-catching um, behavior for some of the um, uh, competitors, and worked on trying to classify what kind of intelligence was needed to play different games. As you can imagine, um, playing games is one of the most common uses for um, AI in the video game industry. Usually what's used are relatively simple methods. This here is a very simple planning algorithm called A-star. Um, but there's also a lot of essentially cheating going on. Um, that wasn't cheating. That was just the controller being much better than you are at playing Super Mario Bros. I'm sorry, you, you, you cannot even approach that. Um, but it's um, um, people basically try to build AI that works for a particular game and that makes you wonder how much does that teach you about intelligence in general? So we did some work on trying to set up competitions where the AI would have to play a number of games um, and even in not, not even knowing which game it was playing beforehand. So what you see here is exactly the same code playing these three different games in the same framework. Um, and the idea here is that um, by learning to play um, not just one game, or like being able to play not just one game, um, you, would, um, um, you would be forced to learn some kind of general skills, some kind of general intelligence. Because if you think about it, say that you had an AI that could play all of the top 100 games on the iPhone app store, or all of the top 100 games on Steam, and be good at it and win, wouldn't it be some kind of general intelligence in that kind? Wouldn't you say that that's actually general intelligence? Um, especially if it had never seen these games before. It wasn't developed for these games particularly. So this is one of the research frontiers here, trying to come up with AI that can play not one game, but uh, all of them. Um, but it's not just about playing games. Artificial intelligence is also widely used to um, create games or game environments. You know, if you've been playing Minecraft, that a um, uh, large part of what's fun is actually creating the game world rather than playing the game. And actually, it's hard to sort of tell these things apart. Um, so there's a lot of work in coming up with new methods for um, new artificial intelligence methods for creating games and creating game worlds. Um, and doing this together with humans. So, for example, here is uh, um, work on creating a level editor for um, the puzzle game Cut the Rope. It's a physics-based puzzle that was really popular maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, maybe some of you may have played it, it's still around. Um, and some of my research team, um, the people in my research team built this um, editor that lets you um, um, edit the levels as you want to. And then it helps you by sort of um, autom automatically checking if they're playable um, and then redesigning them so they are playable, um, redesigning them, um, parts of them. You can tell them that, okay, I want to keep, to keep part of it and I want to redesign the rest, for example. This way you see here right now is the um, editor explaining the particular level to the player or to the designer who just made it. And the idea here is that the creative capacities of artificial intelligence and the creative capacities of human intelligence can somehow be combined. That you have a um, you have a vision that you want to execute, you have something you want to create, but the um, the creative artificial intelligence is not only your um, 
in a slave to you, so to speak, but it's like your partner that has ideas of its own. It's called mixed initiative, this, uh, in this ID, where you have ideas and, uh, the edit and the software has ideas and you sort of help out each other. Um, so this kind of work, um, uh, which I've been working on basically all my career. Um, well, okay, I'll show you one more example. This is yet another use of artificial intelligence. This tool here is not, it is learning to play games, but it's learning to play the games and then analyzing what it needs to do to win the games and then explaining it to you. So it is a tutorial generator. It is creating tutorials for how to play a particular game. Um, as you can see, this is far from like a finished um, product. This is, um, um, it, 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 it is quite rough around the edges in many ways. But what it does, it identifies what are salient actions that you need to take to play a game. Um, and to, what, what is characteristic of when you win, what's characteristic when you lose, explains to you as text, and um, also gives you little videos showing how you carry out these things. We also have another version which um, gives you um, small level challenges that teaches you the individual skills. Just like a well, just like a good game is assigned, a good game is assigned to teach you individual parts as you go along. Um, also, how a good teacher operates, because a good teacher gives their students lots of little challenges that together come um, that gradually build up to the greater understanding of how to master some complex tasks. Game design and teaching are extremely closely related. Um, and part of the reason why we play games is that it's so fun to learn new things. Um, and a well-designed games is essentially well-designed teaching tasks. And this interacts with artificial intelligence in both ways, both in the way, uh, both so that in, because a good game is a great test bed for intelligence and because an artificial intelligence creating a good game needs to learn to teach. So my story somewhere how it started with, can we use games to train artificial intelligence for the real world? Because when you think about it, playing um, a game like StarCraft, which is a very complex strategy game, it's like running a company. You have to deal with logistics operation, get the right troops or items to the right place at the right time, do the right kind of research and so on. Um, and even though you can take the best StarCraft AI and immediately set it um, 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 uh, use it to run IBM or something, you could um, use the same techniques to develop AI that could run a company such as IBM. Um, but when you, when you dig further into this, um, you start thinking about are games becoming more like the world because, or the so-called real world, because we have this constant striving for more fidelity and to model more and more of the complex um, behaviors of the real world into games. You can also ask the other question around, is the world becoming more like games? Because the world is more and more run by people who grew up playing games. Um, and these games, um, um, we, we have gotten used to certain game-like experiences. We're expecting rewards when we complete tasks. We're expecting good tutorials. Um, we're expecting certain graphical um, uh, sort of um, uh, um, uh, in, in, in certain graphical conventions, for example. And I think that people running the world are essentially trying to turn it more into games in various ways. And when I say people running the world, I mean you, me, everybody. I'm already living in a game, as you can see here from, the, from my background. Um, I think that's my 10 minutes. Um, so I'm looking forward to more discussion. Here are some things I wrote, if you're interested in to more about this. Um, and I was edit a journal, these sort of things. Now I'll stop promoting myself. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Julian. And I just posted a link to your website in the chat where there are links to those uh, books as well for, you, for those thank of you that want to dig in, dig in further. Um, 
and thank you thank you very much for a great uh, presentation i think we're off for a really good start in this uh, hour we will invite you back at the end for the q a so please everybody ask questions in the chat uh, and we'll make sure to incorporate them uh, in the discussions after the talks uh, our next speaker is Hao Li. he is the ceo and co-founder of pin screen a company that makes ai driven virtual avatars and in the coming 10 minutes, he will talk about the capabilities that are given to us with a virtual connectivity, but he will also reflect on some of the problems of, of these tech trends that involve virtual humans. Please welcome Howie. Uh, the screen and microphone is yours. All right, thank you, Martin. Um, so we've just seen that you know the world is uh, getting increasingly virtual. Uh, we're experiencing a gamification of society, and uh, that also means that uh, it's some it's a phenomenon that's being accelerated by our current situation of the pandemic, right? And I think these are pictures that we're very very familiar with uh, these days: uh, physical distancing, people wearing masks. There's less and less of this social aspects in our lives. And, uh, you know, a lot of events, music events, sports events are all being shut down. A lot of businesses have to close. Um, and uh, what's happening is that a lot of people are focusing on going online, going virtual and exploring what kind of new capabilities we can do uh, to have a simulation of this physical experience in a virtual environment. And, you know, this is basically our daily lives now. And that's why we're having this conference talk uh, all via uh, video conferencing, and it's not po po probably not the best way to interact with each other. So the first thing I want to do is show you a couple of uh, interesting technological trends uh, that are related to this virtualization of how we interact with each other, how we interact with machines. And uh, also something that you'll find the common theme here is how do we virtualize ourselves, right? Here's a great example of telepresence technologies that you know, Facebook Reality Labs is working on. So imagine if you can uh, interact remotely, you're not uh, in the same physical space, but you can actually all be teleported to the same virtual environment uh, using your personalized avatar. Here's a, another example in an augmented reality setting where you would digitize yourself uh, as an avatar and then have the ability to collaborate or socialize in a common space, right? So this is an example from spatial.io. Now, regarding music events, um, there are also people being creative. That's what that was even before the pandemic. Um, Travis Scott uh, is being digitized into a virtual avatar, teleported into Fortnite, and they're leveraging this game platform, allowing people to basically see their uh, favorite celebrities performing uh, in a virtual event. And we already seen that at the beginning of this, um, uh, at this uh, couch lessons. Um, there are also virtual influencers that are emerging on the internet with, again, millions of followers. And th these are not real people. Now, the problem is, uh, it's great to have a lot of virtual humans, but there's also reason why we're not seeing more of these things. And one of these reasons is that CG humans aren't the easiest thing to build, especially in a computer graphics setting. So <clears throat> I've been working for over 10 years on the problem of how to digitize humans. Um, I've started a lot of work in the VFX industry. Here's a great example from Terminator uh, Dark Fate, where uh, you know it, real actors are being digitized. So you have a younger version of Sarah Connor, younger version of Arnie, um, and uh, creating these high fidelity uh, digital humans is something that's very, very expensive and time consuming to create. And even though you have technologies that allows you to get um, one second, uh, real time uh, characters that can be driven through performances, creating those assets is also something that takes you know, month and month to create. So one of the things um, that you often need is you need to digitize the actor that you want to put inside a virtual environment. And to do so, uh, one of the things is that you need to have high-end capture systems. You need a lot of artists to process the data, et cetera. So one of the works that we have been focusing on uh, 
how you accidentally muted yourself. Is it better? Yes. OK, sorry about that. Um, so one of the things that we've been working at Pinscreen is how to generate avatars um, by democratizing it, right? So we're allowing people to actually generate avatars themselves. Now, one of the issues is if you want to create something that's realistic, usually you need a lot of capture um, capabilities to achieve that. So what we did is we developed an AI that allows us to generate very realistic humans um, from just a single input image. So we can create a very realistic 3D avatar, including its expressions from a single input image. So from at the uh, upper right, you can basically input photographs of people that we've never seen anything else from them. And on the left, we have a driver that allows us to not only digitize the 3D face, um, the face in 3D, but also generate expressions from that face. And it's a technology that can be done in real time. And one of the first application that we were exploring is puppeteering someone in a real time setting. So what you can see over here, you know, we took a picture of uh, our famous uh, Kim Jong-un uh, from the internet, and we can basically generate his facial expressions in real time and overlay onto the person. So <clears throat> what happens is around the same time, one thing that we saw in the news was um, <clears throat> suddenly there was an emergence of a very similar technology called deep fakes um, that had a very, very negative, um, you know, PR around it, right? So it was used to, um, so there were, uh, there was an emergence of um, fake videos where celebrities are being inserted into pornography. And, you know, we got calls from uh, investors, like, was it you guys? And it wasn't us, right? It was someone who actually posted uh, open sourced code, allowing anyone to generate that. And that's when we started to think about, we had to do something about it. And we had to uh, start looking into how can we um, use some of our capabilities to prevent or even fight against uh, these type of issues. So um, Pinscreen is actually um, collaborating with DARPA. We got a contract from DARPA to actually um, work on how do we, how can we detect um, AI synthesized media manipulations. And one of the things is that we want to go beyond just detecting, because even if we can detect, it doesn't mean we know if the content is real or bad. So we're working on problems like attribution, where does the source come from, and characterization. Is the intention of the video good or bad? Now, one of the things that we have been working on recently is generating extremely high resolution deepfakes. The, the reason we want to do this is to basically improve our ways to detect. So here's an example with Jair Bolsonaro um, on a video that can't be detected by uh, any uh, deepfake detectors. Nunca houve injustiça tão grande quanto a prisão do presidente Lula. Que crime esse homem daí cometeu? Ele não tem triplex da praia. Um, at the same time, we have been collaborating with the World Economic Forum um, to raise awareness of the very fast advancement of deepfake technology. So we developed uh, a booth where we have real-time deepfakes. So imagine if I would use these kind of technologies right now as a Zoom, so it might not be me. Uh, speaking. So it's a booth that allows you to actually swap your face with, you know, one of your favorite celebrities. And you can basically see uh, that it can generate very convincing uh, deep fake uh, experiences. So you can swap your face with any person you want and uh, without any pre-training, etc. So it really enhances the access accessibility of these kind of technologies. So why do we create deep fakes? We're not actually in the business of creating deep fakes. Our purpose is really to create virtual avatars that look like real humans. But the core technology is used, is very similar to those that are used for face swapping. Here's an example of what we're actually doing. We're trying to create extremely realistic virtual avatars that look much more real than CG ones, uh, which often have this uncanny valley problem. Let me play a video. Hi, this is Digital Mick, kind of the successor to Meet Mike. This is me driving this digital character in UE4 thanks to a persona rig from 3Lateral that's reading my expressions, feeding into a 3Lateral facial rig inside UE4. 
I also have on an XM suit to get my body motion. Now this is great and we love it, but as much fun as I am sitting here at the Motors Lab in Sydney, I can take this to the next level thanks to our friends at Pinscreen. This and the obvious applications are, you know, for example, we can create virtual models for fashion um, and a natural extension that would be to digitize celebrities as virtual influencers. So there's new ways and new opportunities here, how we can actually generate uh, virtual avatars at scale and use them for many, many applications. One of the core applications that we're focusing on are virtual assistant. For virtual assistant, the idea is that you want to go beyond the use of just AI chatbots or voice assistant. You want to have visual feedback. You want to be able to see the other person that you are talking to. For this, you need a full stack AI NLP, which is something that we're working on, allowing you to not just recognize the voice, generate the voice, but have the intelligence behind to actually talk, um, to have a decent conversation with the person. So let me show you an example of what we're building. We're actually building a cloud-based virtual assistant that allows you to access, interact with the avatar as if we are having a live video stream. So here's an example of what we're doing. Start recording button and just start interacting with them. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm good. I've been watching a lot of anime recently. What about you? Oh, really? Huh. Uh, I haven't been watching any uh, animes. Um, I've been working a lot lately. What do you do in your free time? My job is pretty boring. I just work online and browse. <laughs> Uh, I'm, well, my job is kind of interesting. Uh, we're actually uh, working on some state-of-the-art artificial intelligence technologies. That's cool. How long have you worked in that field? What's your favorite thing to do? So here's a sneak peek, uh, basically, of uh, what we're up to. So we're, in the end, trying to build a fully autonomous uh, digital human that look and behave like us. And one of my dreams is, you know, once we'll have technologies like holographic displays or things that can actually project things into uh, our reality, uh, we'll be able to experience things that we see a lot in science fiction movies. One of the examples are in Blade Runner 2049, where you have the ability to talk to people that don't really exist naturally. So that's it. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ping me at uh, howatpinscreen.com and also visit our website to see uh, what's new. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hao. And of course, there's also the possibility to add questions in the chat and we will pick them up uh, in the Q&A uh, in just uh, a bit. Uh, but now to our third and last speaker, uh, we're going to dig even further into the, the misuse of AI's capability of appearing real, but not uh, being it. Uh, with us, we have Giorgio Patrini, who is the co-founder excuse me, co-founder and CEO of Sensity, uh, a company that developed uh, technology for detecting and monitor monitoring online visual threats, including deep fakes. So Giorgio, please take us into the world of deep fakes and, and what we can do to detect them. One second, let me set up the screen. It looks like you're already sharing a screen. Um, for some reason I disabled my keyboard. Okay, I think it's working out. Uh, thanks a lot Martin uh, and everybody uh, for having me here tonight. Uh, it's a great pleasure to um, to come to talk about uh, some of the work that we're doing at Sensity. And actually a great introduction also for my talk of, uh, by, by how we are gonna dive into a side of the question as, um, um, as was introduced by how um, I guess so most of the time people um, ask me to uh, and, and want me to talk about the darker side of, of the fakes um, and hopefully the point of view of what uh, security uh, and a security company can actually do uh, about it in terms of a solution uh, for, for everybody, for making everybody safer in a world that maybe is becoming a, a little bit more um, you know, challenging to handle with this technology out there. Um, and indeed, one, one of the messages I want to give, uh, really want you to, to take home is that you, 
don't have to believe don't don't um so don't think that uh, these type of technology are still today just in the hands of researchers uh, as the team of our and, and many others uh, around the world that are improving this technology uh, to bring it to the next level the point is uh, this technology is also getting very widely accessible and open source uh, and easy to use and therefore someone is going to use it for uh, for the bad reason so that's uh, that's what we are after trying to understand uh, what is the scope of that and what we, what we can do about this and one of the first questions that i get uh, starting to dive into this is uh, well is is the fakes really a problem or is more like a media hype uh, um, what is what is wrong about it what is, what are actually people doing badly uh, with with this technology so first of all i wanted to give you an idea that uh, uh, the scale of the phenomenon actually can be measured if i can change the slide yes um and uh, that's what we started to do uh with my team uh, uh building a technology to understand uh, how people were using uh, some of the open source tool for creating defects and the type of content that they are uploading and where um and how they're monetizing what is their intent what are they doing with this so that's uh, that's something that we started doing as a tracking of, uh, of this activity back in December uh, 2018, uh, where we started to look of um, the, the videos that people were, were putting online in, uh, in different communities really around the world. And uh, that's something that uh, um, we have seen as a trend uh, in the last couple of years. As you, you may see, we actually uh, count uh, that the number of uh, fake videos that are posted online every six months roughly is, uh, is doubling in a trend that is is not slowing down, maybe is even uh, increasing. So that's kind of the exponential law uh, growth for growth for 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 fake videos online. Um, so that's uh, given this number. That's obvious already that uh, it's not just a small circle of people that have in their hands this technology, but is more and more community that uh, find an incentive to uh, create some of these uh, content and post it online for whatever reason. Um, where where are these people? where are these people actually sorry i'm just having trouble with okay can you actually see when i change the slide like this okay great thanks um where where are we seeing this happening also in terms of geography it's uh, it's quite interesting to see that this is not a problem just uh, maybe in the united states where a lot of this technology arguably is being uh, invented and, and publicized uh given the internet is is accessible everywhere we've seen a lot of communities a lot of hubs um in the you know in the surface of the web or even sometimes in in the dark web as, as we search and find that, that are spread everywhere around the world and in particular also in some hub spots in asia where people um know uh how to build and improve the system make those more usable uh and uh, inexpensive uh, to use also with uh, with cheap hardware to you know create face swap and some and some of example that we see in a or to put uh, words in a video uh, that were completely extraneous to the people that are actually featuring that video that is uh, sometimes called uh, lip syncing. So for, for the data that we have, we have seen uh, um, more than 3,000 people that we are able to recognize as uh, public figures, celebrity of sort, politicians, people that are often in the news, business, business person, and so on, uh, that are targeted uh, without uh, their knowledge and they are posted uh, with those videos online. Uh, and you see, geographically speaking, it's also not just a matter of the United States or Europe, but actually there are some some places in Asia where uh, this is uh, this is coming actually quite quite relevant in terms of uh, content uh, share. But I guess important question is what are these videos mainly about? Uh, this is hinted uh, by some of the news that were shared uh, uh, by how in the in the previous talk. So this is some investigation that we did uh, last year that I think is still provides the, the freshest look in terms of uh, content type uh, uh, if you look at the larger scale. So this is a unfortunate news. Uh, that's something that we uh, th that was probably known, uh, but we really dig into the uh, understanding of the data at the granular level. And we found out that the vast majority, so more than 90% of the, the content that was uploaded online uh, that we could classify as deep fake, uh, at least up to uh, last year, but it's still trended, we can confirm today is related to uh, fake pornography, which means essentially that uh, there are several communities online that also monetize on this type of content where the interest for users is uh, seeing the face of a celebrity uh, overimposed onto uh, adult clips. 
of course, uh, uh, without their consent and most of the time also without their knowledge, which comes as a surprise when somebody, you know, break the news and go to tell them uh, as, as you've seen sometimes in the news. So this is actually also in, in contrast with what people may do more create, um, more uh, from the point of view of creativity or, you know, entertainment, satire. Um, this is, uh, if you look at in this community, 100% of the target of fake videos is indeed uh, 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 against women. So it is a problem that we only see uh, in, in a very gender unbalanced way. That's not really the case when people do more creative work uh, and they post their, their stuff online for satire or entertainment or you know taking inspiration from movies. Uh, so that, that's a problem that we still uh, can confirm today. And uh, that's, uh, I think uh, it's gonna be hard to not see that more exacerbated in a way unless the legislation actually go uh, and try to fix uh, the issue here because this activity is actually not obviously illegal today. Um, so this gives you an idea about the large numbers, but uh, it's also important to understand that what happens when people, instead of you know posting thousand, thousand and thousand of videos that this could be a community, what happens when people have these tools in their hands and could uh, design and execute more targeted attacks that maybe are even more nefarious and dangerous. So we have seen uh, several examples in the last couple of years. Uh, um, I just want to bring up a, a sample here more here just to give you a, an idea of the span and the surface of attack of some of, the, some of this technology can be used for, which essentially enrich the, the toolkit of uh, hackers or people wanting to spread misinformation and so forth. So we have seen uh, journalists publicly shamed uh, online with fake videos on themselves, sometimes uh, pornographic. Um, we have seen a, a politician uh, sometimes uh, um, relying on the fact that they could uh, um, denying that they were on a video since somebody could have made them up in a very realistic manner. So it's a matter of, you know, news and a plausible not about anility also in front of a court. Uh, we've seen also cases where uh, some fake personas uh, or fake videos have been involved into foreign espionage and uh, cases of national security around the world. And then it's also um, uh, the, the, the very last one for which uh, this is interesting also because you can attach to it uh, some sort of uh, monetary uh, damage, as it was reported by uh, some insurance company last year, there was also a case of a, of a fraud by synthetic voices uh, impersonating a CEO of a company authorizing a monetary transaction. So, and all of this is happening literally because uh, the way that we have built uh, a lot of our social fabric, uh, um, talking about uh, uh, business uh, exchanges, uh, information uh, and politics uh, and whatever else we do is, based on our appearance as individuals be recognizable by our faces and our voices. And uh, when we see one of these two elements uh, with somebody that we know, either personally or publicly, we rely on that, uh, even if it's on the other side of a, of a call like this one. Uh, so I think this is, gonna, this is gonna change very quickly in the future as more and more of this uh, is coming up as a, as a problem for frauds and disinformation and you name, and you name it. So why this is happening so fast uh, this is really a problem that we have only encountered in the last two or at max three years, really. Uh, it's because, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is not uh, anymore in the hands of just, uh, you know, a small cycle of researcher and, and, you know, PhD researcher that understand how to operate these tools. Uh, this technology is becoming uh, uh, commodified. I wouldn't say democratized. Uh, I like to take, a, to take a more neutral approach because this is actually also exploited for bad purposes. So lots of these tools are reproduced online and they are open source. Graphical user interfaces are placed online, um, and uh, um, you know, uh, once you have the tool, it really depends on who is going to use it uh, when it is uh, on the internet. So this is out of your hands, even as a, as a developer, even if uh, you did it just as a research project. And then a tutorial, we see tutorials, webinar. There are all communities that actually uh, are grown around are, are grown around the, the development and the uh, improvement on usability of some of these tools, so that most of the time actually come for free. But this is mainly for, you know, still developers, if you wish. So there's still some level of commitment to get to use those. Uh, we have seen the development in, in, instead of uh, uh, marketplaces and uh, um, uh, web portals that we start to describe as a deep fake as a service, where essentially you don't want to, you know, get your hands dirty in the tools. You will pay somebody else on the other side of a computer to make a fake voice. Uh, make a face swap in a video that then you can play, um, you can post online. Um, you know, we, we also see, uh, you know, people be getting very creative with uh, 
subscription services with discounts and so on. We have seen people hiring deep fake managers to automate as much as possible the creation on their own website. And uh, some of these are actually, you know, very, very much, some of these activities are very much at the boundary of uh, legality in a way, just because a law hasn't been written, uh, it doesn't mean that those are necessarily illicit, but people find a way to monetize and they are not stopped. So that those are actually businesses that are growing in a way, which is really justify the number that I gave you at the beginning. And then um, to, um, to complete this, uh, I think uh, what is interesting is uh, this year uh, we have seen uh, uh, really in 2020, the rise of consumer apps. Uh, so there's been a several companies, several teams around the world that have put uh, some of this technology for space swapping, um, um, you know, body transfer, um, lip syncing into your phone in a very simple way, very often inexpensive. And that this is gonna grow uh, user and potentially also misuses in, a, in, a, in an explosive direction. And we already seen that, that um, this year. And, you know, just, just in case you haven't seen, I'm actually trying out one of these uh, uh, while, while I'm talking, um, you can actually see my face is swap at the moment. Um, this is, uh, you know, something that you can install yourself on your desktop or on your mobile. This is some filter that is uh, that that you can use from Snap Camera. So that's uh, it's really, and and you don't have to pay for this. So that's literally something as meant as a game, but that can give you the idea of how easy it is to use uh, some of this technology today as consumer application. Um, so what what can we do about this? Uh, I wanna I wanna give you also some light at the end of the tunnel. That is really what inspired me and. And, uh, and my team to, you know, to work hard to, to understand that what is the right angle to approach this problem. And uh, we think that this is uh, the point of view of, uh, of cybersecurity. So if my team, we have put together expert in uh, AI, um, well, like myself, that's kind of my background where I used to do research in, and uh, as well as the people that understand threat intelligence. So um, we want to understand that not just how to detect uh, with computer vision some of these uh, um, uh, some of this creation, just looking at uh, the content themselves, but also we want to be able to track uh, as much as in real time as possible they users from uh, um, those communities, the actors, and give attribution. Uh, uh, some of them, as uh, as was also mentioned in in the talk just just before. So to give you an idea of the type of uh, of things that we are covering in terms of threat intelligence. Essentially, I build a technology um, that uh, every day um, scans uh, for many places that are uh, social media and video platform and uh, hundreds of borderlines forums and community that you will find on the, on the deep web or on the dark web. Uh, such as today, we have collected something that we believe are certified more than 60,000 uh, fake videos that could be actually damaging uh, their reputation uh, uh, or being you know, a shame for somebody uh, to have them online for, for themselves. And we work with uh, um, you know, talent agencies, cybersecurity uh, firms that uh, would like these, uh, um, they would like to receive this information as fast as possible so that they can decide uh, how to remove it, uh, how to you know, scale this up, um, you know, escalate these internally to take you know, the right uh, approach to essentially crisis management potentially. And uh, we've seen this on, you know, again, uh, quite spread on uh, over a different industry. The big one that we still still today is really I say entertainment um, together with fashion. Most of the people that are targeted by this uh, by this kind of content is still people that are that have a, a very strong uh, public um, public appearance uh, online persona, uh, either because they are in movies, they are singers. Um, you you understand that they become the biggest, uh, in, most interesting target for people, unfortunately. But still, uh, something that I haven't included here. It's uh, something that we're actually releasing uh, in in about a week. Uh, it's, uh, it's a new report that will also show that these uh, threats and these, uh, in a way, attack surfaces also move into average people that simply have uh, some visual content on social media. And this is something that is actually uh, coming up more and more with our activity this year, which is quite uh, threatening because that really will, uh, you know, put uh, each, or, each, each one of us uh, under threats uh, in the future. Which I think it's an you know, unfortunate direction, but that's uh, quite clear uh, as the spread of these technologies. So once we detect, once we see, or once we uh, um, see what, what we want to search and what we want to cover with our threat intelligence, what we apply for filtering and to understand the type of content is uh, um, computer vision essentially and deep learning to get um, to know if uh, um, part of the uh, human bodies in particular faces 
on these uh, on these videos and images have been uh, manipulated or have been fully synthesized uh, so that we we can um, essentially get, gather only the relevant information that we can establish uh, with some sort of uh, confidence uh, it's uh, it's fake and it's relevant to um, you know to collect and tell to potential stakeholders that it is online. Um, this is from the technology part. Uh, my uh, my company and my team. I'm also proud to say it's, we are actually very involved also in a um, you know awareness campaigns and some sort of uh, you know we spend some time also in educating the community on these problems. Uh, and as I'm happy to be here today, obviously, some a couple of activity that we did uh, that I want to highlight that we did quite recently. Uh, one with uh, um, in collaboration with Microsoft and uh, uh, the University of Washington uh, um, just uh, about a month ago. We release a, um, a, a fun to play uh, quiz that is uh, still online, you can see uh, at this uh, website, where essentially uh, also in preparation uh, as potential uh, uh, you know, danger uh, re relative to the US election. Uh, we wanted to help uh, and teach people on how to see, how, how to spot potentially fake videos and images and what are the clues that they should look into. Uh, this sort of content to really distinguish them, uh, um, you know, real, real from uh, from fake, from manipulated. So that's something that you can play uh, online, really, to teach, to teach yourself some of these uh, of these tricks, uh, uh, so that you can learn something next time that you're on Facebook scrolling it, and maybe you have a, a few questions in your mind before you just share it, uh, you know, brainlessly. And that that's also uh, that's also good to uh, have that minute of uh, uh, thinking through before that happens. And uh, something even more recent as, as an experiment that you really have released uh, you know, this Monday. So very happy if anybody this year wants to send us feedback. feedback. Um, uh, we, uh, we are online with uh, our threat intelligence platform that is supposed to give to anybody an idea at uh, uh, aggregate level of the type of threats uh, uh, around the world to, uh, for, for all the type of uh, videos and images that we are collecting. And in particular, we have created a, a you know simple dashboard. This is it's very it's very trivial as presented uh, uh, for anything that we think uh, it is uh, interesting to show with respect to the incidence of uh, fake videos and imagery uh, for uh, that are that have been created recently for um, so featuring the U.S. Uh, 2020 candidates and uh, people in that surrounding and other politically prominent figures in the US. So this is something that is updated every day, um, almost automatically, except in a few cases. Uh, so please take a look at some of his feedback. Uh, this is uh, um, something that hopefully is going to be useful uh, as, as a tracker for the next uh, uh, few weeks in the US at least. Uh, well, uh, thanks a lot and uh, happy to take questions and have a discussion with everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Giorgio. And thanks also to, to Julian and Hao. Uh, I see that the first question is just uh, coming in. I'll, I'll just, uh, I just want to start with, with, with one question. And that's to George, you, Giorgio. I mean, this, this just to me seems so massive. And, you know, the scale and, and the use cases and the threat seems so vast. Is there like anything like when it comes to to, to, to these types of threats that you can compare with in the past? And is there anything that we can sort of learn from how we've dealt with similar things in the past? Um, I can't really compare in terms of numbers, but uh, as a, I think as a nice, uh, uh, at least for, for myself as an analogy, as uh, I think people should think of as this problem, I think uh, uh, we can think of the battle between uh, um, you know anti anti malware and malware software, uh, which is I mean it's it's something that is obvious for us uh, in the internet era, but it wasn't something so obvious maybe in the 90s uh, yet, where a lot of software for anti malware has been built and then put it in uh, places in businesses and then finally in, in the end of consumers. Um, I think uh, um, it is it is something that. Uh, Unfortunately, we will not be able to solve uh, at the root uh, because we always going to be whatever we put in place uh, uh, in the system systematically to try to stop people creating bad content that could be you know compromising um, you know your reputation, uh, putting you in a place that you've never been, and so on, uh, or you know fake and um, opening a bank account with your face and you know, a fake password. For any measure that we are going to be put there, uh, there's going to be somebody else. Even more clever, that would just to think about this something new, improve the tools, uh, find a new hack. So in a way, this is a um, 
and I think uh, back to the analogy of malware anti hour, anti hour, it's not something that we can just solve forever, but it's something that we can be very vigilant and keep building and doing research on uh, what uh, um, is done uh, uh, by bad actor on the internet every day and be as ready as possible to be defenses, uh, to build and, uh, um, and, uh, and put uh, defenses online. So I think that's, that's gonna be a lesson that, uh, you know, it's a hard one uh, because, you know, as, as, as a scientist, uh, you know, you want to find a problem uh, for, you want to find a solution for a problem deployed and uh, that's it. Uh, but in this case, you also need to face with the fact that uh, if there is incentive on the other side, uh, could be monetary, it could be political. There is always going to be something, somebody doing something better, and there, and therefore you can't stop uh, working on it. So, so, what do you recommend? I mean, ordinary people like myself and probably everybody else in this call to do. I mean, yeah, what's what's the first thing we should do tomorrow? Yeah, it's it's a very hard one, uh, and uh, I think uh, you know it's also uh, my recommendation. Also, seeing uh, the trends that they're seeing this year that is also moving on, uh, you know, average people uh, being being under threat, being under attack. Uh, our recommendation that I have is uh, really make sure that you understand uh, about your privacy and about uh, the when uh, when you share content that is uh, your own. Uh, so videos of your family, with with your friends, with your in intimate situation you really need to understand who you are sharing it with before you do so, in particular on social media. It's one thing if you do that as a job, so you want to be seen because it's part of your brand, it's part of your identity. It's another thing if you are just sharing it with everybody without knowing, because then one day, unfortunately, um, you, you, may, you may have to pay uh, for that because of somebody could just exploit that. So it is, it is a hard one, and uh, um, I, I, I think it's... Uh, it's, it's going to be taking a lot of education for people to get uh, to get there uh, as we are used to share anything that is on our mind these days. Okay, thank you very much. Before we move on with two more questions on deep fakes, I want to ask uh, Julia and how uh, a, a question that is more of on the sort of the entertainment side of things. Uh, I, I'm super fascinated by the Lil Miguela case. Uh, is are, the, are there any other sort of entertainment based? Uh, uh, interesting, cool new things that that you see uh, emerging, either in the game space or in in the in maybe more general entertainment space. This was very open ended, right? <laughs> yes, for you and uh, but uh, I'm super curious to, to hear from you and also from how. You want to start? No, I'm, I'm still trying to, I'm still parsing the question. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> um, well, there's a lot of cool stuff for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. I think if we are within uh, the context of, let's say, virtual humans or virtual worlds, I think uh, we have to see a little bit like how things are developing, right? And um one of the things that I think is kind of interesting is that entertainment is changing these days. If you look at just 10 years ago, right? We would go to the movies, we would, um, you know, Hollywood was, I mean, we're in LA here and Hollywood used to be something very different. Uh, it has shifted to, you know, people having these kind of entertainment from home. So streaming services are huge. Um, people play a lot of video games uh, these days and the video game sector is also uh developing very drastically right and uh, you know the pandemic is one accelerator but it's not just that right it's also like how we interact with devices so um we have to see how we um you know people use their phones nowadays people back back in the days used to watch television nowadays we have um you know cell phones what means is that a lot of the content becomes more and more personalized right so and it goes for ads, right? Uh, advertisement, what kind of videos I'm watching, what kind of games I'm playing, everything becomes more personalized for the individual. So I think there's something very interesting happening there. And obviously even just talking about, you know, personalized content experience, that's where there are also other kinds of threats that can be uh, very dangerous. But at the same time, 
it also improves our experiences with how we interact with the digital world. Now, um, if we go back to, you know, virtual avatars and, you know, all these things, um, I think one thing that I'm, I believe is that we are going to interact way more with artificial intelligence or a non-human autonomous thing than actual real humans. And in some ways it's, it is already, right? So if you look at how people are interacting with machines, everyone is on their phones all day, that the world wasn't like that before. And people talk less to real humans. So I think this is sort of like a world where we're moving toward. Um, and I think, um, and I think what's really important is that it's not, not necessarily something that's bad or good, but I think we need to make it in a way that it's beneficial for us as humans. Um, so interestingly, I mean, uh, I agree with basically everything that Tao says here, because basically I, um, I, 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 I th it just struck me that I really didn't even talk about this. I worked a lot on personalized um, content generation. So what we see now with like all our social networks and Netflix and whatever, we, are, we have personalized content recommendation and selection. Um, so um, what I've been working a lot with is like um, um, ways of not just selecting good game levels, game characters and so on, but generating them based on estimates of who you are and what you do and what you are capable of. Um, so, and, and as, I, as I think that we basically, as Hao says, we're going to interact more and more with these worlds and inside these worlds. This is both good and bad. Um, it's good in the sense that we'll get um, more interesting stuff to do, lots of more interesting stuff to do. And we'll, I mean, I have this vision of like truly infinite games that keep generating new versions of themselves, of the games themselves, in order to sort of, you know, um, uh, to give you what you want, even before you, you knew you wanted it. Um, we call this experience-driven procedural content generation. Of course, this um, risks running you into um, some kind of filter bubble, like we talk about filter bubble with social networks, like you surround yourself with people who think um, and look and sort of reason like you, and, uh, and then you just get your prejudices or just general new way of thinking um, amplified. And this might be the case in virtual worlds as well. Another potential issue here is that when we are handing over information about ourselves on the internet, we are you know, posting on Twitter and Facebook and, and whatever, we are sort of aware that we are telling some kind of computer system, the algorithm, capital A, um, about ourselves. When we play a game, we don't, we're not aware of this. However, research from us and others have shown that you can predict a lot about how someone, um, a lot about people from how they play games. Because basically you're sitting there and you're inputting information at very high frequencies of playing a game and you're reacting to things that you experience. And you think you are playing as someone else, like, you know, you're like a, um, 17th century assassin or like you're a space marine or whatever you are but in fact you are yourself um with a very thin sort of you know layer of fiction sure in real life you don't go around um shooting shooting at people hopefully but you still have yourself your reactions your reactions to the mma a, a, how you react and what you sort of think about particular people and other stimuli we've shown that you can basically um uh, predict people's personality, uh, the life motives, um, uh, gender, age, and so on, relatively well from these things. And this is, it's great for, for the, um, um, it's great that you can endure to do this for our ability to personalize games and entertainment experiences and give you more of what you didn't know you wanted. But it's also somewhat concerning because all this information that can be used for various purposes. Yeah, thank you very much for, for these uh, reflections. Um, we look forward to experience more of those personalized uh, um, worlds or not, we'll see. Uh, Shanet, I see that we have some, some really good questions in the chat as well. Do you want to 
lead this part of the, the show? Yes, and first I want to um, ask Max Maximilian Daltes uh, to ask your question personally. I think it's for Giorgio. Maximilian, are you still uh, with us? Ah, uh, maybe. Hello, hi. Yeah. So I have a question for George. So, what happens when you actually detect the deepfake? Can you like take it down from the site immediately or not? Uh, that's it. Thanks. Yeah, that's uh, that. That is possible. That is something that uh, we we have done several times. So the fact immediately, maybe that's not the right adjective there, in the sense that you always uh, need to hope for some collaboration on the other side. Uh, it's not something that uh, you, you send a request and there is some authority that will take it down unless it's uh, blatantly criminal. Uh, the fact is uh, you can often appeal to um, the fact that your image and be, has been misused without your consent uh, and has been uploaded somewhere. And that sometimes is already enough for uh, removal from communities that are quite responsive, but uh, that's never 100% guarantee. Um, the fact is uh, um, when that doesn't happen and you need to recourse to legal action, uh, it, uh, it really goes and clash uh, on the fact that uh, legislation is unclear if uh, this activity is uh, obviously uh, illicit. So let's say uh, the, the short answer is it is possible, it is not guaranteed, uh, but that's, uh, that's what you would uh, aim for uh, anytime that we detect something like this. Okay, Thank I see, you. thanks. Thank you as well. And there's one other question from Katharina Henning about identification. Yes. Hello. Um, I, I had a general question. Um, I was wondering, uh, Georgia, I think you, you mentioned that um, there, uh, the faces and the voices um, can no longer be, be uh, surely uh, an indi uh, in, an indi ah, sorry, uh, identification um, aspect. Um, and and um, we're not really sure if the, the other person we're speaking to is really the one um, we were seeing. And I was wondering, is there um, something else we can use as a um, specific identification aspect or, or key? And if yes, is, do, do any of you have, have an idea of what that could be? Um, because I'm, I'm coming up blank um, and, and uh, we generally use very easy things uh, to identify each other. Um, and so I was wondering what that could be in, in this context. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thanks for your question, Katarina. So I, I guess uh, I, I don't see this necessarily a threat for, um, you know, having a Zoom call with your friends because uh, they wouldn't really justify the effort, right? But, uh, in, in other places uh, where you can actually move uh, a lot of money uh, in the wrong way, as it could be opening a bank account, uh, uh, opening, a, um, I don't know, do some transaction with your insurance fund uh, or maybe um, requiring document from government. There are cases uh, and countries that uh, would actually let you um, open and uh, onboard on their services just looking at uh, your face or your voice as an ID. Uh, and usually they would have a way to match a pre-recorded uh, register message or video or password from you. Um, so those are the kind of, of places that we see uh, under danger at the moment. Uh, uh, and we actually have uh, some ongoing research at the moment in see how in, in trying to elicit how easy are those to penetrate with uh, defect technology. The, the, sh the answer is uh, um, it's about uh, to build a multi-level system uh, of trust. So you can never, uh, I mean, that's that's obvious already in the industry, it's just another level that we have to build. You can never trust just one system. Uh, so you don't want to, you probably don't want to uh, have somebody accessing your bank account, just uh, uh, taking a selfie of yourself, or maybe sending a voice message to recognize a match with pre-recorded content, um, because now that could be synthetic. Uh, it wasn't before and I could be synthetic, but uh, the point is uh, uh, 
if as soon as you also ask for a photo of your passport or a message from your phone, uh, there becomes uh, harder and harder for an hacker to have all of these at their disposal to execute the attack. So it's about building a new level of defense also for if you are ingesting, if you are uploading um, and receiving on the other side or something that could be your voice, but that has been computer generated, uh, the defense should be also up to detect that type of material. So it's about building more, more confidence. I don't think it's all, it's all lost. I think it's just about uh, updating and educating ourselves for that this is needed. Lovely, thank you. Sure. So I hope there is uh, time for one more question because there is a very interesting one from Mauricio. I hope I pronounce it right, Queveto. So do you want to speak out? Yeah, that was perfect pronunciation, by the way. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if our interaction with AI gets closer and closer to the way we interact with other humans. I'm guessing there will be a point when it will be quite hard to uh, make a distinction between the two. So what would be the beneficial impact and when we reach that point of interacting with AI over interacting with other humans? I guess that question is for me. Um, uh, have you seen The Matrix? Um, yes. <laughs> there's a scene where you have the blue and the red pill and then uh, you have to pick one. So one is the one that's perfectly optimized for your life and the other one is reality. And um, so, okay, so I, th <laughs> I think the answer is um, in a virtual environment, um, the avatar can be, so let's imagine you have all compute capabilities in the world. The avatar could, in theory, be completely optimized to suit your needs and uh, fulfill your, um, you know, whatever would make you happy. In uh, the real world, it's uncontrollable. Well, it's not completely uncontrollable, but it's less controllable in whatever simulation you're creating. So that's a, you know, sort of like a philosophical answer. The short, uh, the more practical answer is imagine, um, you know, I need uh, very quickly talk to a, a doctor. I'm not feeling well. In the real world, you have to, you know, have a schedule an appointment. You have to call someone. It's very, you know, tedious. Imagine you have an app, you can just talk immediately to someone that's 24 seven available to you. Imagine you want to go shopping and I don't wanna to go to the store and have the risk that you know, uh, the person isn't competent enough for you know, recommending certain products. You basically could have a cloud-based avatar that has all the knowledge in the world and give you the perfect answer for everything. So in some ways, and for certain tasks, I'm not saying every task, um, for certain things um, and in the near future, it's very possible to replace a lot of the services using a, you know, it could be just a chatbot that can provide you better responses, 24 seven availability. And uh, you know, you never have to wait in line. Um, and uh, for getting you the information that you need more, you know, better. But then there's also applications where if you think about if, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, who have, uh, you know, who are above a certain age, um, they might lost, have lost a lot of people in their families and uh, they may want to talk to someone, right? And if you think about like the uh, possibilities of social avatars who have the ability to just give you, you know, some level of company, right? So people, let's say they have some, disease, they're in hospital and they're there for, for months and no one is talking to them except, you know, one hour a day from a nurse. And, you know, that's something that um, th there are definitely applications where interactions can be simulated and can also be, and when you play video games, right? So it, there is a similar experience. You get so much immersed that you are part of a story that maybe it's part of an entertainment to interact with another person inside, right? So I think there's definitely something that is very similar there. And I think um, it might be weird for maybe people in our generation, but people in the next, in the upcoming generations, it might be something totally natural. They might have a lot of friends that are completely just simulated people, but have behaviors that are fully adopted to your, uh, to your personality and to your, you know, whatever your needs are. 
But if I can, if I can also reply quickly on this one, which I think it's it's a great question. Uh, um, maybe I have a, a for once a positive take on on something uh, tonight. Uh, uh, maybe the optimism. Um, I think even if when uh, uh, more than if we will have the, capac the capacity to replace a lot of the interaction that we need uh, uh, every day uh, with uh, avatars with AI. I think uh, still as humans, we will have uh, a tendency to search uh, for something that is human as akin to us uh, as original. And the best uh, uh, and, and the best analogy I have for this is uh, if you want caffeine because uh, you need it, you will go to Starbucks. If you want a good coffee, you go to somebody else that actually make it for you. And there is a human on the other side. Well, also Starbucks, but maybe that's the wrong analogy. Point is, uh, you will go where uh, you know that there is a care and there is a human being on the other side that understands uh, what you're looking for. So maybe one day we will see, and I think we are very close to this, uh, you're going to see a lot of 100% uh, computer generated, fully realistic movies in Hollywood. But maybe those are not going to be the high end because we don't see the actors and accuracy that we're really looking forward. So I think that's not going to go away. Uh, and as in many other places, we are still going to be looking for um, you know, human uh, as uh, uh, the original and uh, versus the you know utilitarian when we just need to, to do a transaction and we need to do it fast and it doesn't matter if there is a human on the other side. But I think that's not going to go away. Yeah, and just to add on that, I think um, there are actually applications where maybe people don't want the other side to actually be a real human. So let me give you an example. Uh, if you want to learn a new language. A lot of people are very shy about, you know, exposing their mistakes. So if they know it's just an algorithm back then, back there, but that where you have a face-to-face -face conversation, you're learning a new language, then I think it might make the entry a lot easier. So that's, you know, one of the examples where I think there's a lot of potential for uh, using a virtual, you know, teacher to, to teach them. So thank you very much, Ao. Thank you very much, Giorgio and Julian. It's so interesting. I could listen for hours, but um, I think we have to stop here, unfortunately. I also want to draw your attention uh, to the upcoming uh, couch lessons. Uh, we will have one about AI and democracy next week, and we will have another one about AI and economy uh, in two weeks. And next week we speak about uh, AI and in what way does AI challenge democracy? We have already heard about deepfakes today and about filter bubbles, but we will also f ask if AI can uh, be used to defend democracy, human rights, and things like this. And so I hope uh, you will join us again. I hope uh, you will tell your friends about the couch lessons. You can also watch all the past lessons on our website. Uh, uh, couch lessons, uh, no, <laughs> sorry, goethe.de slash couch lessons. I also put it into the chat and um, hope to see you and wish you a nice day or evening wherever you are. Thanks to all of you. <laughs>